I'm Dr. Mila Brujic, and today we're joined with Dr. Panakin DeVay, where we're going to be talking about iPod, UPod, MPod on this episode of the Optometric Insights Show. Dr. DeVay, welcome, and thank you for joining us on this episode. Um, Panakin, if you could share with everybody a little bit of about your background, um, where you practice, what you do, what your area of interest is. Thank you very much, Malay, for having me. Um, I am a professor of optometry at Western University of Health Sciences. I am the director of clinical research for the university. My OD is from Memphis, Tennessee. My PhD is from Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, England, uh, and was focused on glaucoma and clinical glaucoma. Uh, my fellowship was from Louisville, Kentucky for three years on imaging and glaucoma. Uh, so primarily, I'm a, I'm a physiology, ocular physiologist, and with uh, interest in glaucoma and macular uh, area. That's great, Panakin, because part of the reason why I wanted to have you on today was just to demystify this whole concept of macular pigment optical density. I know that there is a little bit of confusion around it in the general community. So, Panakin, if you could share with us it, the, kind of the best way you can exactly what macular pigment optical density is and then how we actually clinically measure that. Sure. So, um, macular pigment optical density uh, or macular pigment, um, aka we also know it as a yellow spot that we all see in the uh, macular region, particularly in the fovea, is the pigment that we talk about. So it's macular pigment, optical density, meaning how much light can pass through, how much light cannot pass through. So it's a measure of measuring how thick that particular pigment is. Now, this yellow pigment is basically xanthophils, and they are, um, they are actually carotenoids that get deposited in your fovea as a function of your lifelong um, food intake, uh, and even the child or a baby that is born uh, has that pigment present because the mother ate carotenoids and uh, subsequently- uh, So, so Panaka, this, this is related then to the carotenoids that we're naturally ingesting then, correct? Absolutely. Humans have lost the ability to manufacture these uh, de novo, meaning just out of nowhere. We can't do that. We've got to eat these carotenoids, and um, they get uh, deposited in various parts of the body. So we have about, we eat about, uh, on a regular basis, first let's start with how many are present in nature. We have about 750 uh, or so that have been recognized in, in, in nature, and 50 or so are regularly consumed by human beings in their diet, of which about 45-ish make it to the skin, uh, 20 uh, carotenoids make it to the bloodstream, and then they get deposited all over the body. So everywhere blood goes, one should expect these carotenoids to get deposited. And by uh, interesting as it is, that you would expect that if 20 are present in the blood, then 20 should get deposited in the eye. But it turns out to be only two carotenoids that were consumed via diet are actually deposited in very large amounts uh, in the retina. The rest of them don't make it. So nothing in physiology or nature happens by accident. There's always a reason behind it. We just are figuring out, and hence the term research, where so we are searching something that's already, already known or mother nature knows about it, right? And so think of it this way as to this is by design. And even if you look at other parts of the body, for example, let's talk about brain. You know, you have about five or so carotenoids in the brain but the majority of it, about 75 to 80% of the carotenoids are just lutein and zeaxanthin. So they're primarily in the brain as well. And there are other, a few other carotenoids that are present. So an optometrist, it's straightforward, right? Eye is an extension of the brain. Brain has the same kinds of carotenoids as present in the eye. So your first question was, what is macular pigment? Well, that's what the pigment is. The lutein and zeaxanthin that is uh, dietarily ingested by you gets deposited in a very large amount in the fovea region and to a lesser amount away from the fovea as well. So one of the most common misconceptions is that the, you see the yellow spot and the rest of the retina doesn't have it. Well, that's not true. 
Restoral retina also has it at lower amounts, and they serve a real purpose. Uh, we understand it the most because we understand AMD. We understand oxidative damage. So when the light rays are hitting, like for example, when I'm looking at the screen and I'm looking at you and trying to do the zoom, well, light rays are going into the eye. And these light rays are necessary for vision to take place. But the unfortunate uh, outcome is that you land up getting oxidative uh, species or um, waste products that get generated due to this light. And something has to quench these waste, waste uh, reactive oxidative species. And that's what the macular pigment does, or the retinal pigment does, is that it has potent antioxidants that quench these extra reactive oxidative species that are generated and um, make the retina live healthily. So how do you measure this? Well, so Pinocchio, before you go on a step further, so do does the lutein and zeaxanthin that's deposited in the macula, does that actually block light from entering into the eye as well too, or helps any, any form of scatter that occurs? Absolutely correct. So for example, it's a yellow pigment. So we understand television and we understand, you know, we see it as yellow because, you know, yellow is being reflected off and certain light wavelengths are not going to be allowed through. So for example, when you have a yellow spot, the blue is not going to be allowed through, whereas green part of the spectrum can pass through uh, through the retina very conveniently. And if you uh, just vision science 101, blue light is the highest energy light. It has the highest potential of scatter. And if anything degrades your vision the most, it's blue light. So by nature's design, the blue light is prevented from reaching the retina. But when it reaches the retina, the carotenoids present in the retina, lutein and zeaxanthin, they absorb or prevent the blue light from actually degrading one's vision. So a simpler way to understand it would be if you had less amount of it, you could have a less degraded vision, but it's a modifiable parameter. So if you increase the amount in your retina, then one should be able to measure better vision in that patient. So you don't have to settle for the vision or visual function that we have. We can enhance our visual function to some extent. So clinically, how, how do we then take that and measure that in a clinical setting? Right. So there are numerous uh, devices that, um, you know, in optometry, we understand both objective and subjective techniques, right? So let me start by saying that objective techniques are available only in the research realms and are not available to regular clinicians. So, Panakin, when you're saying objective, you're talking about taking some type of imaging of the retina and saying, this is your level of macular pigment. Correct. Correct. So let's take an example of if I shine a light in your eye and then somehow measure what wavelength is coming out from your retina. So think of it like OCT uh, kind of technique, right? What does OCT do? It actually uh, measures the echo time delay. So you're sending light rays in. How much delay was there between the first layer and the second layer, or if you're looking at spectral domain OCT, you're looking at the different wavelengths reaches the retina at a, a different region. And so you can actually calculate minute distances. Similarly, one could send light rays into the into the retina and then calculate what light rays come out. And we know that the yellow pigment or xanthophils are going to absorb the blue light. So we can actually know what wavelength went in, how much blue light was there, how much didn't come out, and so we know how much pigment is present. So although it sounds like a really cool way to do it, it is affected by a lot of things. For example, and hence this, these are only research toys. Um, you know, cataract can affect these, these values. Natural fluorescence of certain objects can influence these values. Um, and of course, these devices are pretty pricey to stand alone, even in the research toys, and they're just not manufactured or commercially available. So the only device that has actually penetrated significant amount of the market is a heterochromatic flicker photometer. It's a complex word, but it's pretty simple. Hetero, meaning multiple. Chroma, heterochromatic. Flicker, you perceive a flicker. And photometry is measuring light levels. So you are sending a particular wavelength of light uh, into the eye. And by the eye, by its direct nature, is going to absorb certain frequencies or wavelengths. 
So this heterochromatic flicker photometer is a direct measurement of the true pigment that is present in your retina. There are other devices that you can try to measure in the skin or the finger, and these are proxies, and I'll, I'll actually come to that in a minute. So the clinically and commercially available technology is, is that a patient looks into a device, you patient will observe a light that flickers, and patient will click a button that says, I see the flickering light. As simple mm -hmm. as a visual field, except much more simpler, because rather than seeing lights everywhere in visual fields, you just have to concentrate on one LED light. And if you see it flicker, you push the button. And what it does- Malcolm, is it correct to assume then the darker that light has to be in order to see the flicker, the higher your level of macular pigment optical density? Correct. So when you are observing a flicker, why do you observe the flicker? Because there are two wavelengths in there. There's green and then there's blue wavelength. And the amount of blue to the green ratio is changed. Patient observes a flickering light. You're mm -hmm. not going to see them green or bluish flickering. The patient has to simply just push a button if they see the light flicker. So it's <laughs> one LED source that's going to flicker, and then you just click a button. You're so changing now, the amount of blue. So one, one second. You're changing the amount of blue. So think of it this way. Just as you said, you are going to increase the blue, 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 blue until the maximum amount of blue is absorbed. At that point, you're only going to have one wavelength present. And so you won't see the flicker. And then you change, you continue varying again. And then so you can figure out what's the maximum blue that was absorbed. And it's a direct conversion of the yellow pigment present in in your in your fovea. It's interesting because normally we're looking for the min like the minimum signal that somebody can see is actually being better. But in this instance, it seems like it's exactly opposite. The higher the level of blue that you're you're flickered with, the better the protection is in the macula. Correct. So so, Panakin, I know that there was the tabletop version, but you've been doing a lot of work on this handheld version of this device. Tell us a little bit about that, how it's similar and how it's different than the tabletop device. So the principles of the tabletop device, we just explained, you're changing the blue to um, uh, blue to the green is being varied, and you are going to measure the maximum blue that is absorbed in in the in the retina and so the principles of heterochromatic flicker photometry is the fundamental basis in the handheld device and let me tell you why um certain engineers and scientists worked alongside with me and i was just a a clinician uh trying to give ideas and saying why is this a crucial important point so desktop devices are space occupying things and you know from your private practice you know space is a premium Having another device disrupt your flow of patient care could be a real problem. Now, I see the background. You have a foropter and you have a retinoscope and ophthalmoscope. Wouldn't it be cool if you had just a similar handheld device kept right there, which a patient doesn't have to change rooms? You just give the patient a device, which is handheld. Patient can be comfortably seated at any position they want rather than an artificial you know, trying to bend your neck into a position so the ergonomics is comfortable for the patient. Or even knock and moving them to another room. Like, right. you have to move them to another room. You're absolutely right. You don't want to disrupt your flow in busy clinic. So what, we, what was needed was a good device that can measure this reliably. It has to be portable. And it, does, it should be least disruptive to the clinic. And the patient can do this. The long-term goals where we should be able to do it at home, et cetera. So we'll put that in a bin for now. But yes, yeah, so I worked with a group of scientists and engineers and that finally came up with heterochromatic flicker photometer, but a handheld device. It has a computer in it. It feels like the size of a, a retinoscope or an ophthalmoscope handle. It has all the infrastructure in it. It has audio prompts to tell the patient what to do if you want to train the patient. Um, and it, Look, uh, how long does the test take? Okay. So the test, uh, it takes on average about two minutes to two okay. and a half minutes. We've decreased the time. So the desktop device used to be about two minutes or two and a half minutes. And now, uh, we have brought it down a little bit, but on average, I'd say two minutes, uh, or so. So Panak, when, when you're taking the measurements on this device, um, is there ranges like, well, first of all, what's the range that it will give you and what's, 
considered a low low number or what would be considered a high number? Fantastic question. So, you know, um, I this is not original. Somebody else, a friend, used this term. The standard American diet, aka known as the SAD diet, is actually the determinant factor of how good or how much pigment we have uh, in our retina. Unless people are supplementing extra, there are certain ranges that have been established where we know where you expect an average American to be, which is fantastic because it tells us how much can we enhance or improve. To answer this question a little more clearly, start thinking of MPOD as a biomarker. You are measuring a value. Let's say I measure your blood, blood sugar. It's a biomarker. What I do with it is an important question, correct? As yep. to whether or not that makes it a risk for diabetes or prediabetes is another question, right? And it has multiple implications because you can measure my blood sugar and yet say things about my brain health and my life expectancy and, you know, far from my just my diabetes management. Macular pigment as a biomarker can help so many different disease states. It is, it, it is an arbitrary number ranging from zero to a 1.0 maximum, right? So the scale, the density units are put in a, put in a region where what arbitrarily lowest level measured is zero, the highest possible ability to measure is 1.0, right? And most average American will measure around 0.35 or 0.34 in, in value. Now, I want you to remember that it's very simple. We can use simple statistics of quartiles and say that I am going to put you in the upper quartile of the population, and this should decrease the risk for various diseases. Okay. So, for example, you are skinny as they come, but does that mean that you cannot have high cholesterol? You cannot have uh, blood sugar metabolism issues. It is still possible. You can be very skinny. You've prevented one risk factor and still be predisposed to various disease states. So by putting their macular pigment in the upper quartile of 0.5, a value of 0.5 or higher, we are decreasing the risk of various disease states and will be the best outcome, a measurable outcome, a direct measurable outcome that a doctor can say that, um, um, that a doctor can say, you can do this for your patient. So a patient walks in with something like 0.35 or 0.4. You say, uh, Mr. X, I'm going to put your data or put your macular pigment in a range where you have less likelihood of getting the disease state. And you're going to try to increase them to 0.5 or higher, where you're now getting a true biomarker, measurable entity, and you can follow up and reach a goal that you have to get to. And I can... This has been awesome, and it's been really insightful to help us understand the science around macular pigment optical density. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We're going to have you back on another episode where we're going to talk about some more of the clinical applications of MPOD and what it means for us. So appreciate you being here, Panakin. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insights Show. Mm-hmm.